Hello, everybody. Welcome to Rock Talk. This is Russell, and I'm super stoked to have with me today former vocalist of Exodus, current vocalist of Generation Kill, Mr. Rob Dukes. How you doing, brother? I'm good, man. How are you, dude? Um, yeah, I'm surviving time. best best as we can, right? <laughs> yeah, three years three years since I've seen you. Three I know, years. I know. It's it's crazy. You haven't been out. Have you been you haven't been out here since then? Have you? No, I have mm. not. No, I have not. We got to get you a new trip soon. We yeah. got to just bring you out to have fun. Mm -hmm. Go hang at Q Bar and see Sip. <laughs> yeah, man. Fucking a. So you're still in Arizona, yeah? Yeah, I live in uh, Chandler, Arizona, uh, about thirty minutes from Phoenix. Uh, east, northeast, actually, or just east. Uh, but, nice. Yeah. So I like it here. Nice. Yeah, and you guys are pretty open, right? Like, I don't think Arizona closed a whole lot. It did, man. It it, it closed. It closed for you know uh, a good you know six weeks, where the only things were like gas stations, supermarkets, uh, all the bars were closed, all the restaurants, fast food was open. Um, and then uh yeah so but there was like retail stores were open but you could only like you could call and and place an order and then they would meet you at the door and hand it to you and stuff like that so it was pretty man i just you know what i mean i, I stayed home i went to work i stayed home my job was an essential I, you know I, yeah i worked at a small shop so um you know i just uh i work on cars so i'm by myself anyway so you know i mean our shop has three people working but uh you know we're all doing our own thing so it's kind of it was easy to stay apart and it was easy to just to follow the the regimen of it all you know what i mean nice so, nice and it, so they were yeah. doing curbside pickup and everything it was still kind of kind of functional yeah you know what's crazy i i uh at one point i uh i started like eating like shit and then i i kind of like got off that train i started cooking at home only for myself and and so uh, I like I started losing weight and I started like working out, started running and feeling nice. better and so you know starting to feel it's all right, man. I mean hopefully the hopefully there's it all like they either get a vaccine or it goes away or at least it's it's manageable at this point and keep the people that are uh, in in a dangerous situation. Hopefully they can just keep them isolated and everyone else can go back to work and you know I feel fucking terrible. I feel terrible for like restaurant people you know people that because you know most restaurant people they don't i mean i don't think they had a huge savings or, or like i know like i know like my crew guys that i dealt with over the years yeah the most respond, they just lived on tour so they just they didn't they didn't save their money they just kind of it was like one continuous road trip and uh so i feel bad for all those people man i feel bad for people that that didn't have a uh that you know you know, what I feel really bad for someone who was like basically on the on the cusp of getting their shit together. Oh, and and then it hit, or or they were just about they just cleared up their credit and they just they were kind of like, and then they and then this hit and it fucked everything up. I feel bad for those people. I mean, so, we we were sitting, you know, when uh, when we started Rock and Mortal at the beginning of this year, we were just getting to a point where we were starting to starting to do regular events. Um, we did, you know, we did one in December. We brought Goat Whore out here to San Francisco. Um, Fanwich and Hatchet. Goat Whore. It was a fucking great goat show, whore. man. I love those guys. Fucking Sammy. I just talked to Sammy like two days ago. Man. Nice! Like, uh, I love good. Sammy, man. Sammy and T.A. is a good friend of mine. T.A. is a real good friend. But we yeah, brought him out, Sammy. and we were doing well. I love all Ben. And and uh, yeah. during all that, you know, we, we started getting regular events, and then this hit right when that started. So it was kind of, you know, you get that forward momentum, like uh, you were saying, and you hit that wall where everything shuts down. And, you know, as you know, the entertainment industry yeah. was the work. We're going to be the, we're the first to close, and we're going to be the last to reopen. And what's fucked, too, man, is like, so to open a venue, to, to, to you know, open an entertainment venue, to open a restaurant, the first year is if you don't like 80 percent fail in the first year and yep. i think it's like the, the another five percent don't make it five years so it's such a uh uh you know hard business to be in and you have to you know put your whole life into it and just to have this thing have to fuck it all up this is to just see that it's it's, a, it's tragic man it's fucking tragic it and is it's the craziest time in our lives <laughs> the craziest time 
like I, you know, my dad's kind of, you know, my dad's older, so I, I talk, he tells me about the '60s and the and the race riots and all that shit. He goes, man, this is this is just like that. It's just, yeah. it's that crazy. Yeah, you know, he said. Uh, I feel like know. a lot of people aren't making that connection either. They kind of they they feel what's going on, and and you know, hopefully most of them support it. They should, in my opinion, my humble opinion, but like. Yeah. You know, it's that it's that concept that they they see what's going on, and because in you know at least in my lifetime coming up on forty, I've never seen anything like this. So, yeah, I mean, I I haven't either, man. I mean, it was you know the, that was before my time. I've, I'm a you know a history buff, so I, I read all that shit, and it was you know it's the same shit. But you know what's fucking crazy, right? Is is that the internet and technology? It's a double edged sword. Yeah. Because on one side, it's fucking and massive that I can I can stay in touch with my friends in Germany and my friends in Sweden on a regular basis. Yeah. And it, and it, and it's and it's actually uh quite inexpensive to do that. Where you are you still have to write a fucking letter. And yeah. then on the other side of it, you know, this is all this really like dark shit that's been going on has been going on a long time. And the only reason it's come to light is because you know, as Summer said in a Rick and Morty interview, man I see more shit before breakfast than you did in the fucking 60s. You know what I mean? Because, yeah, cause the, the amount of information that people get is just, it's so overwhelming. And uh, I, I truly, uh, you know, need to unplug more than I do. I, I, I'm, I'm, I stopped watching the news like a month ago, man. I just, I couldn't do it anymore. Just I can't maybe, wait. I mean, I, I, you know, I caught a couple, a couple of days ago, caught up with the, with the, uh, you know, George. I mean, watching that cop murder that dude was was fucking brutal. But you know what, yep. man? That shit's been going on the whole time. That's always been happening. It's yeah. just that nobody ever. A lot of people didn't have cameras. There weren't, you know, uh, body cameras. There weren't regular people holding cameras. So nobody was held accountable. They could always just lie about it and fucking. But now, yeah, and sometimes you can't. Now, like, cause there's, you know, there's a camera fucking everywhere. Yeah. And that's the double-edged sword. You know, I, I like my privacy, but I'm also. I remember getting accused for something I didn't do, and God damn, I wish there was a fucking camera. <laughs> yeah, well, yes. wasn't fucking me, man. You know what I mean? Well, it's, but then it's... again, then again, I've done a lot of fucked up shit that I didn't get caught <laughs> for because there was no fucking camera. You know? <laughs> so. Well, we we you know one of the things that I've I've often said is you know the, there's that old adage, um, it's old now anyway. The revolution will be televised, and we need to update that now. And we know the revolution will be live streamed, like yeah, we we know it will, and it is being. And as you said, you know, none of the shit that's happening is new. It's not, you know, it's been happening yeah. for years and years. Now we're just yeah. seeing it, and you know, the cognitive dissonance states that like maybe if you don't see it, it's not happening. But at this point, because of social media. You, you can't turn a blind eye to it anymore. And I feel like that's what a lot of people are realizing. That's what a lot of corporations even somewhat shockingly sometimes are realizing. Yeah. Is they can't just sit on their hands and do nothing. Yeah. I've been, uh, I've been reading a lot in the last like six weeks. I think I've read like six or seven books in the last six weeks and, uh, just, just absorbing all I can. And, uh, yeah, man, read some fucking horrible shit that I, I didn't know until now. I'm like, God damn, like, and it's all history-related stuff, and it's like, God damn, the humans are fucked up, man. Yeah. <laughs> they're fucked. The they've matri the Matrix had it right. They've all, they're fucked. They've always been. Here's the thing about the Matrix, right? Like, here, wouldn't it be, like, okay, you remember when, remember when the dude was sitting in the restaurant and he goes, I want to remember nothing. I want to be plugged back in. And I want to be, I want to be somebody important. I want yep. to be like an actor. Yep. Now, I would have taken that, even after seeing that I was in a pod of goo, right? But if I could, I could taste steak and, and everything was good, and, and I, I would, I wouldn't want to live in a ship with some fucking ratty fucking clothes or <laughs> eating fucking. Fucking to remember the fuck they were eating, like, yep. like fucking. I would have definitely taken the fucking blue pill, man. Fuck yeah, plug me back in. Fuck I, that. I mean, yeah. honestly, I would have, I would have popped up and said I wanted to be the president. Then maybe I could have fixed some shit in the process, right? <laughs> but, but none of it mattered because none of it was real, so it didn't matter. It I, I wouldn't remember, right? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. 
So, all right. So, everybody's obviously right now, we're all focused kind of on the on the quarantine stuff and kind of how locked down. Yeah. But one of the things that I've been trying to do desperately is is stay on the music. Because, you know, that's okay. one thing that that's one thing that really, really keeps us all going. It's one thing that, you know, is, is a binding force right now. And yeah. there are very few things, I feel, that are unifying right now. Um, God knows we need a hell of a lot more of that. So, yeah. I want to start with you. Um, you know, I was reading up and, you know, I've known you for a few years, but I never really looked into your history. I just met you and, oh, he's cool. I like him. All right. Yeah. Um, but... I understand that uh, when you first got started, you know, Exodus was at that point already definitely a thing. <laughs> yeah. And yeah, I, used to, I used to go see him. I used to, I've seen Exodus a ton, a ton of times before. I even, yeah, when I was a kid. I, I mean, I saw them when I was like 17 years old. I was, you know, it's, so it's crazy I, to I, think I, that you, you went and saw him as a fan and then you end up like, you know, the big, I think the biggest story like that, like, you know, other than yours is that guy who journey found on youtube or something like yeah. that this guy who was doing yeah. karaoke yeah. and they were yeah. like you want to come yeah. sing with the band <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> but you went yeah. out you were in new york you were in a band what was the name of that band cheat and soccer mom it was like a ska punk band uh reggae it was kind of like kind of like sublime in a way a little 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 you know i'm not gonna say heavier but we had uh, a couple heavier songs, but it wasn't really. I played guitar. That was all I did, and, and they were already a band. They had another guitar player, but they wanted to like kind of do something different. And I was, I, I was, uh, I was, I was working at IBM, man. I, I wore a suit, a uh, three-piece suit to work every oh, day. Damn. <laughs> and then, so uh, I was working a regular job, and I, I just did it for fun. And then. Um, so I played in that for a while, and then that kind of ended, and I was dating this chick, and that ended all around the same time. So uh, it was it was it was like maybe six months after 9/11. I went through all that with with them, and then and then I said, you know what? I need a break, man. I need a, I need to get out of New York. So I uh, I left, and I I got I gave away everything I owned to my friend Rob, um, and I got on my motorcycle with a, a fucking backpack full of clothes and. A PlayStation Two, and, uh, and I took <laughs> off, and I ended up in uh, I ended up in Los Angeles. Uh, so I, I prior right prior to that, I had been scuba diving for a couple of years, and I wanted to become a scuba dive instructor. That was my plan. I was going to move to LA, and I was going to move down to like near the beach, and I was going to get a job on a boat, and I was going to go learn to be a scuba dive instructor. That was well, that was my plan. And, and you uh, had the you had the training for that already and everything too. You were ready to no, do it. No, or? no, no. I mean, I was already a scuba diver. I was already scuba diving. I was already, uh, and, you know, um, uh, certified. I was already doing all that. I just needed a, a diving instructor's license. So that was my plan. So I go to LA, and I, I meet uh, I, I meet my friend Chris uh, Davis, and uh, Chris hooked me up with um, uh, the owner that uh, the manager of of the key club, and um, so. I started working at the key club a couple days a week, and because uh, I, I didn't have a job yet, I, was, I just, I dude, I'd been there like maybe like two weeks. Yeah. And um, and uh, so I got uh, I, I got a job there, and then that led to a job at the Dragonfly bartending and bar backing on certain nights and bartending some nights, and then that led to the L Ray loading in vans, loading out. So I could, I could. Uh, work like four or five different clubs in, in a weekend and make like you know like fucking 600 700 bucks in cash yeah uh, it was it was be, it was before uh, before uh, they got taken over by um, what's the big entertainment company that does all the clubs now oh uh, uh, I mean it's either golden voice or live nation Gold, the golden voice yeah yeah so I, I worked for live nation and golden voice so eventually I, I got hired by golden voice I started I did other things. I did the Warp Tour. I did uh, Coachella. I did Stagecoach. I just worked, and that was cool, man. I, I worked down in Anaheim. I worked on the uh, on the on a uh, Finding Nemo and, and down in Anaheim, working on the, on, the, on the stuff that you have to go display over at the movie theaters, and it was cool, man. I was working with a bunch of old punk rock dudes, man, and, and uh, it was killer. I was making good money and, and just chilling, and then I started working for bands and started guitar teching. Um, because I knew stuff about guitars, so I could set one up, I could intonate it, I could, you know, I knew how I knew how to fix stuff anyway. I've always been that guy, so 
Um, hooked up with a band called Camp Freddy with Dave Navarro and Billy uh, uh, Duffy, and there's a bunch of other cool players, uh, Jerry Cantrell, Steve Stevens, and I, I got to work with all these really cool people. And then one night I got a call from uh, uh, this guy Jeff, and, uh, who said, hey man, um, the dude got fired from the Negative Tour, do you want to go tech on that for six weeks? And I was like, sure. And he goes, well, just go home, get your passport, and meet me at the Palladium. So. Uh, I took a cab to Palladium and I got on the Exodus bus and I was like, hey, <laughs> it, was, it was me, Rick, Gary, and Tom sitting there and, I, and uh, Steve Escobar was singing and I, and I said, dude, do you guys remember the show in Lakeland, Florida when the fucking barrier collapsed and broke that dude's leg? And they're like, fuck yeah, we remember that. I go, yeah, me and my friends caused all that mayhem. We were the mania. We were the maniacs that made all that fucking craziness happen. We, I think we, I think was, I actually met the dude whose leg was broken too. It was, so it, was like, Tom's, <laughs> it was it was Tom's like brother-in-law or Tom's like Tom like Tom. He was someone one of Tom's friends. Yeah. Anyway, he, he was okay, but there were, they were we were throwing bottles at the cops. A cop car got set on fire. <laughs> they were like this, like we that, that place got turned. And, and, and Alexis never even played. They played one song, and it just fucking went crazy. And then. Anthrax tried to come out and calm it down. They were like, everyone calm down. And they just got pelted with bottles and cans and shit. And then uh, it was just mayhem. So we all like bonded right then and there as soon as I walked on the bus. And then <laughs> we did a tour. We did a tour for six weeks. And then the last show of the tour, um, I got up and sang a song with Steve. And um, and then uh, and that was it. And then, you know, like, like a month later they called me and said hey you want to come audition and I was like sure why not was it was it like weird getting on that bus with with those guys like because I know you were a fan before well, was it one of those things where it's like I, holy I, I, shit I, I mean look I, I you know yeah I mean I was a fan but I, I wasn't uh, it, it was just a job you know what I mean so yeah. it wasn't like it was it was like I just had to be professional so here's the thing and a lot of like text I mean um there used to be it used to be roadies were like drunks and drug addicts and fuck ups and all that. And those days are gone, man. Now you got it's gotta be total pro. So I showed up with my gear and my fucking guitar rig and all my tools and I those guys, man, they uh, Gary was like, You're one of the best techs I've ever had, man. Thanks. I hope we can do this again at the end of the tour because never broke a string, never out of tune, never I mean, because I just I don't drink, I don't do drugs and I just did my job, man, the best I could, you know. You know, it was cool, man. It was a fun tour, hanging out with fucking with uh, Willie G every night, learning from that fucking guy. Uh, he's a you know real big guitar tech in the scene and uh, a really oh, yeah. good. Oh, dude. I, I think I, he's probably the most known guitar tech in metal. Yeah, really and truly. And like, so, so, so I learned a lot from Willie in that in that six weeks, and then so going on from there, when I became the singer, he came to work for the band, and you know, it's like. Dude, some nights, man, just to keep myself sane, I used to like go out and load the gear with the with the guys because I just needed to needed to be sane. And, and that was the one thing, man, that being a singer and coming from where I came from, man, I always like appreciated the text, man. I thanked them every night at the end of the show. Yep. I always, uh, you know, I, I ate with them, I, I hung out with them, I, I uh, you know, it wasn't uh, it, it was never lost on me where I came from ever, ever from the from any time I ever did it and. You know, I, I still, still talk, talk to a lot of the crew guys, man, like uh, Kevin and, and Willie, and, like all still fucking talk. And it w even if I didn't become the singer of Exodus, it would have been that way regardless because they were all just good people. And, you know, so we, uh, you know, those are the guys I feel bad for because they're not going to work the rest of the year. And, I mean, hopefully they're okay. You know, I mean, I, I haven't uh, spoken with any of them. And, and um, I mean, everybody's got their own personal shit they've got to do. But anyway. Let's, uh, I don't want to talk about the COVID. Let's just talk, yeah, let's keep it. <laughs> everything, no everything right now just happens. happens. <laughs> no matter what happens, it goes back to that. I know. So it, it, well, that's our world right now. It's like this circuitous nightmare. It just keeps coming back to that. So, anyway. It is. It's, it, so, I mean, it's yeah, the world. So, so that's how, so the, the, one of the big things that, that people are, like, so I rode my motorcycle 14,000 miles to get there. Like, I left New York. I ended up in, in Key West. I went scuba diving. I went to see uh, my mom at one point in uh, Jacksonville. I hung out with my buddy Steve in Jacksonville Beach. I went to uh, to New Orleans for a while. I went to Austin for a while. 
And I was kind of like working here, working there. I worked in, I at a hotel, uh, tearing out windows. They were they were replacing the windows to make them uh, hurricane proof. So they, it take it, it would literally take a day to cut out the old window and put in one window. So I stayed at this hotel for like a month, and I just got paid, and I had, didn't have rent for a month, and I just saved some cash, and then I just kept. All right, I'm done here, man. I'm, uh, this is running its course. I'm out. And I, I remember leaving, and I got caught in a. Uh, in a snowstorm in Fort Stockton, Texas. It hadn't been forever. And I was there for like four days in this shithole hotel. I mean, being... Um, next station. I, I was living on like Twinkies and Ho-Hos and fucking... <laughs> and you, I, I couldn't... Cars were going. I couldn't go because I was on a motorcycle. And it was fucking freezing, man. It was I was... Like, like, I, yeah. I'm originally from Texas. And I'll tell you, the, the biggest problem in Texas isn't when it snows. It's the fact that they're not prepared for snow at all. So they don't know how to handle it in the slightest. They don't know how to take care of the roads, nothing. Like somewhere, I, somewhere I have pictures of like cactus with snow all over them. Like, you know, <laughs> which you, you'd see that in like high desert stuff, but you wouldn't see that in fucking Texas. No. Yeah. So anyway, I, I made it to LA, and then and then that happened. And the next thing you know, I was in, I was in them, I was singing in Exodus. And I remember when they called me, man. I was I was getting tattooed, and I I looked at my buddy Rob and I said, Hey, man. I just got a, a audition to, to go sing for Exodus. I go, so basically that means I'm going to be the singer of Exodus. And they're like, <laughs> yeah, all right. And yeah, I, I knew I was going to do it. I knew that I knew that I could do. I could do that. Like you know, after watching, um, you know, being being in bands a lot, I knew that you know. I mean, one part of me was you know I'm not going to say I was overly confident, but I was. There was a part of me that was terrified of the unknown, but there was also mm-hmm. like. Like, I knew the history of the band. I knew the the legacy that I was walking into, yeah. and I, I I was a huge fan of of Bailoff, and uh, and and I I just I remember Rick telling me that dude, you he's like he's like dude, you could you could fucking do this, you know, you just you just carry the fucking torch, man, and just be yourself, and and you'll be fine, and 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 that's what I did, and you know I did it. The, I, you know, while I was in the band, I used to get shit on bad by fucking tons of people. And now that I'm not in the band anymore, everyone's like, oh, we fucking miss you. I'm like, nobody's, not one person fucking said that when I was in the band. But then again, nobody <laughs> ever said to my face, nobody walked up to my face and said, hey, dude, you're the fucking worst singer on the fucking planet, and I fucking hate you. You've ruined Exodus for me. Nobody ever said that to my face. They say it on the internet all the time. Oh. But nobody ever said that to my face, so. Well, I mean, anyway. one of the one of the cool things, and... Personally, I think it's a cool thing is, you know, they're the stages of Exodus. You know, a lot of people talk about bands having like whether they have a consistent lineup all the way through, which almost never happens. Even bands that are known yeah. that, you know, known as consistent. Usually they like went through spi- one or two people before they fucking spinal tap. Yo, God. <laughs> but, you know, in you guys' case. And and this comes from like the Exodus group on Facebook, the one that you're pretty active on, um, and Rick E is is pretty active active in as well. Um, yeah, yeah. You know, one of the cool things about that group is the most common thread is Zetro or Dukes. Like, yeah, I like I, Duke, I, and I'm I, like, why can't you just I like it all? It. I said, why? I, why can't you guys just shut the fuck up, man? Like, right. Just, leave it alone, man. Just enjoy what it is and fucking stop. Well, like the, the know, band has been fucking. That's fucking awesome, man. Yeah. That's fucking, well, and the band has been lucky fashion. enough to have three A caliber vocalists. Like mm-hmm. between you know, I mean, in terms of like the the main releases and stuff, you know, you've got you Zetro and and Bailoff, and like, what band gets that lucky? Yeah. You know that's well, that's insane. You. Well, thank you. That's a that's a nice compliment. Um, so, you. with that, speaking of all the vocalists that Exodus has had, there's something that I've I've wondered for a while, and it and it's one of those things that, you know, following music and knowing the folks that I know, when you guys did "Let There Be Blood," which yeah. of course is you know "Bonded by Blood" extra track on there, but a re-recording of Bailoff, which was Bailoff's only album, really, you know, his only studio yeah. album where he performed. Yeah. It, like, was that, did that feel weird? Was that kind of an honor? Like, how does that oh, hit totally, you as was, a was, fan, you know? Totally, like, it was, it was totally an honor. I mean, originally, it, we were supposed to do it live. It was just going to be a live thing. But it ended up, we just, 
at the time it was just too expensive to record a live show like that's just the way it was in that in that time era or the or maybe it was just financially the way we you know we the money we had at the time so we, we we're gonna record it live we actually played it live at the key club in its entirety in its order like we started at Bonden and worked our way all the way to uh strike and played it in order and it was fucking awesome and then that's what kind of fueled like hey man maybe we should do it on the anniversary of the year 30 years or whatever it was or 25 or and then I, I we did it, and I remember saying like, "Okay, man, let's fucking do it." And then, and then they said, "Well, we made change of plans. We're gonna do it. We're gonna we're gonna re-record it. We're gonna go in the studio and do it. And some songs are gonna play a little faster, and some songs we might like slow down just a little bit. And just because we played them differently now, you know, after years of cultivating. So yep. basically, man, I just tried to honor Paul the best I could. That was, you know, you know, Paul, he, he, you know. He didn't know what he was doing. He just kind of, he was kind of winging it. You know what I mean? He was a, what, a fucking 18 year old kid just winging it. And like, so I know that if he could have, he would have done things a little differently. He would have been doing them differently 30 years later. So, I mean, granted, I, I just, I, I just, I tried to keep it as true as I could. The, the recording itself was, it sounded a little better than the original. Not, not taking anything from the original because the original's like carved in stone. I yeah. mean, it's, it didn't, I didn't replace it so where you can't buy the original anymore. It was just like an updated version of the way we were doing it now. You know what I mean? It was like strike was a little faster and the lesson was a little faster. And like, so anyway, Connor, to be able to sing fucking no love and deliver, I mean, come on, man. Like, like why would, why the fuck wouldn't I do it? It was yeah. fucking awesome. Those, well, put, those I mean, put, put beautiful, your stamp on a classic. Like that's, yeah, that's a dude. beautiful thing. Yeah, man, totally. Yeah, and that was—I think that was limited too. I think that one was limited to like fifteen hundred or twenty-five hundred or something, somewhere in that number range in terms of the vinyls that came out. Yeah. So I can't recall what the number was, but it was either fifteen or twenty-five. I still need to get my hands on one of those. I'm gonna work I think on. I, I think I, I think I have two of them. Yeah. <laughs> you can send me your so. spare. <laughs> <laughs> so, <laughs> with with all that, obviously, you know, several albums with Exodus. Great fucking career. When you were out performing with those guys, what was the biggest crowd you you uh, performed with that you can remember? Well, the 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 Vakin show was was incredible, um, and you know it was uh, it was. I mean, it was. I don't know. The number never really said. I mean, it was anywhere from sixty to a hundred, like depending on the day or the time or whatever. But I mean, it looked like a shit ton of people to me. That's all I remember. <laughs> I remember, I remember the the everybody that like, want to know what? Why'd you wear the American flag shorts? And I go, well, the reason that all started was about we walked up to the stage. Everyone was getting their shit together, and I, uh, you know, I still had that thing where I, if I if it was a it was it was a show, I'd throw up before the show started. You know what I mean? I think I just got nervous and I. would I'd be full of nerves, like, you know, just uh, before the show started. So uh, I remember walking up the steps and seeing the people through the, the amps and all that, and I just fucking started yakking, right? And oh, man. One of the, uh, and I started throwing up, and then I'm standing there, and I'm wearing a, a, a shirt and, a, and a, um, a pair of black shorts, just cargo shorts, and uh, some German guy goes, so he was, Lee was wearing, like, a, a shirt. He hadn't changed into his state shirt yet. He was still wearing a shirt and had an American flag on it. And he was talking to Lee, and I was standing there, and he goes, "Yeah, man, we, like you know, Germans really hate when you're when Americans are patriotic." And I went, really? <laughs> I was like, "Really? Cool. I'll be right back." And I ran to the bus, and I got on my shorts, and I was like, "Fucking, I'm here in Germany. Fuck them. I'm doing this, man. This is what I'm doing." I that was the reason watched, I wore the shorts that day. I actually watched a video of that today. <laughs> you know, yeah. When well. you, you ran, you ran a fucking fantastic wall of death at that show, and you were up there screaming. Yeah. The first thing I fucking noticed. With the shorts, yeah. first thing. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, and it was all because they told me they fucking they hated it. <laughs> Trolling the shit out of them the whole time. <laughs> so, yeah. So, so you yeah. speaking yeah. of speaking of walls of death, I, you know, I yeah. we we know the energy from a crowd is is fucking important when you're on stage, right? Like especially when you get get to that higher level where you're playing for even like ten thousand, you know, something like that. There's a palpable. Yeah energy coming back up from that crowd so 
I've heard a lot about like crowd energy. What's the yeah. feeling when you see like at that festival when you ran that wall, you separated everything. Like, what's the energy and the vibe and the feeling you get from running a wall of death where you've got five hundred people coming from other oh. side, either side, slamming into each other, like. Yeah. Just orchestrating uh, it. You know what I mean? You know, man, it was, it started out some it start I forget, it started out years before that. We were doing it forever, but it just was the right moment in the, in our set to do it and it was uh and it looked like everybody was having fun doing it, man. I mean, I'm sure people got hurt, I'm sure people got fucked <laughs> up. I, look, I've been in plenty of pits in my life, man. I got fucked up and it wasn't a wall of death back then, man. It was like just regular pit. And yeah. uh I, so but it, I also had, I also like remember, I remember going to see, uh, I, it, there was a club called Streets in New Rochelle, New York. And mm -hmm. uh, I went and saw, um, it was uh, it was Sacred Reich and um, uh, I forget who else it was. I forget, but during during Sacred Reich, man, they, they, I was in the pit and I got fucking jacked, man. And back then I was like, you know, fucking 18 years old and fucking lifting weights and built like motherfucker and I remember just running around the pit and just fucking and I got fucking jacked and I remember just but I left there with like a black eye but it was like this sense of pride I was like it was like a yeah I fucking did that you know what I mean and, and that's kind of why that's what I always got out of it man I just want everybody to have fun man. if you didn't want to be in it you just didn't go in it you know what I mean you just yeah. put it aside and fuck it. but um you know I mean I never really. No one's ever asked me. That. I, I honestly, I don't know the feeling that goes with it. It just, I know that it just. I don't want people to have fun. I want people to walk away going, "That was a great show," you know. So. So it's kind of it kind of relates to kind of bringing back the giving them the feeling that you had when you were mm -hmm. out at those shows and kind of giving them that same release. Fuck it, man. I remember. I remember. Uh, just always like giving people the set list at the other night and throwing water to them. And I remember like, you know, being in the crowd at, at shows like that before I was a, in the band, how I, how, if that happened to me, I would have fucking remembered it forever. Yep. You know what I'm saying? So, so like there've been times though. So, so we, you know, it's weird. A lot of shows you'll see like little, little kids with headphones on and stuff. So we would bring them on stage and put a guitar around them and fucking, <laughs> and then they'd stand on the stage. They'd be like five years old. My nephew was like nine. And I brought him up on stage and put a guitar on him, and he, dude, he, he ended up being a fucking guitar player and uh, and becoming a guy in bands, a little metalhead. You know what yep. I mean? Um, it, it really stuck with him. So I know we did that all over the world. We had pictures of it. You know, Lee was really good for that too, man. I mean, he'd always stand there and help him hold the guitar and fuck his. Anyway, man, it was always wanting to give the, the crowd the, the experience that that they would have. So. I never had a hard time like talking to them after the show or, or before the show. There were, I mean, there were certain nights when you're just exhausted and you just want to go to bed. And, yeah. And, uh, but but for the most part, man, I, I I signed everything. I talked with everybody. Shook as many hands as I could, and and um, I did my best to to be uh, to to remember that I was a fan. You know. So. Yeah. And I mean, you do that. You do that even now. You know, like you you still yeah. out there and out there online trying to make sure you're available accessible like i see you in mm -hmm. in groups and comment on things people are like you know does anybody know what dukes would do xyz and you're kind of like oh i'd do this <laughs> and a lot yeah. of people are like whoa <laughs> yeah well you know i mean it's you know, it was a, it was a really cool chunk of my life and i um, and i'm grateful for it and i you know i love you know when when people want to talk about it and ask you know I, i'm totally fine talking about it man because i had so many good stories and so many good times and uh, you know i've been i've been all over the fucking world you know multiple fucking times i've i've been to these really grand places and then you know on the other side of it too man i got to make you know <clears throat> i remember we played uh we played the song the sun is my destroyer in san francisco and um i'll never forget how I, I stood there for a moment and there was this, the middle section where it kind of gets bluesy and it's kind of like this and, right? yeah. and there's this part and, and I'll never forget like turning around and looking at Tom and everyone we all kind of like looked at each other and we were so locked in and that was one of those moments man where where you you can't explain it to somebody who's not in a band like and those happened all the time man we had some nights man where we just we were just we were just killed man it didn't matter it didn't 
no other band scared us. No other band. <laughs> we we opened for fucking Slayer. We didn't give a fuck, man. We were our own deal, man. Dude, I'll tell you one really funny story. Um, so Des Ferrara, you know who he is? Uh, yeah. Cold Chamber. Yep. Fucking, so Des. Now I I like Des, man. I've, I've hung out with Des a bunch on tour. We we did. Uh, we never played with Devil Driver alone, but I always saw him at the festivals, and he was always very nice to me. I was always nice to him. But I have like a fucked up sense of humor too. Also on top of being who I am. But uh, so th- we were going on right before them, right at a at a big festival in England, and. Uh, and he, he was walking by me, and me, Gary, and Lee were sitting in our little, like, in this little table, and we were sitting there, and Dez walked by, and I was like, hey, Dez, you better bring your fucking A-game, man, because uh, you're going on after us. Was this and, uh, uh, was gonna... this Cold Chamber era at that point? No, this was uh, Devil Driver. Okay. I said, I said uh, you better bring your A-game, man, because you're going after us, and we're going to fucking kill you. <laughs> and I was only kidding. I was only fucking kidding, man. I was like, tell you. But he got really upset, and his manager came over and started fucking yelling at me. And I'm like, "Fuck you, dude! Like, fuck you, fuck him!" And it was—I didn't mean it. Mean I liked the guy. It wasn't like I was just being. I remember, I remember reading an article with Ozzy. Ozzy said Kiss was opening for Black Sabbath in the '70s, and he was standing on the side. And Gene Simmons comes by in the boots. He's on. He's got it all shit. And he like bent down. He looked at Ozzy and says, "We're gonna fucking destroy you." And Ozzy goes. Yeah, and they did too. Uh, <laughs> yeah, um, and that was kind of like how I was kind of hoping it would be like a like he would just kind of laugh and give me the finger and go ah yeah. and go out. And, dude, I actually went and watched their show, man. I was, was on, watched their set from the side of the stage, and uh, yeah, that was the last time I talked to him. Oh no! <laughs> Seems like Ozzy had a habit of bringing bringing bands with him that you know, and all due respect to the mighty Sabbath. He had, a, he had a habit of bringing bands on stage or on tour with him that would just obliterate him. That were the next big thing, you know? Like, yeah. he would still put on an amazing, amazing show, dude, but man, the band that he'd man. book would be so incredible that, you know, it'd be he around, around, around that level. Right, he left Black Sabbath and he found Randy Rhodes. I mean, come on, dude. Yeah. Really? <laughs> you know what I mean? Like, okay. And then he found Zach Wilde. What? Okay. Yeah, he just, well, he's... he's yeah. He is the the god, you know. Especially, yeah. you know, with the loss of Lemmy, he is he is kind of, in my opinion, the last living metal god, you know, of that yeah. era, so to speak. Oh, yeah. Let's we we got Rob Halford. Don't fucking oh. don't forget. Yes. Well, you can put Halford. Dude. You can also technically put Dickinson that's in there too. That's fucked up. that You said that. Rob. Oh come I'm on. Tell him that. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. <laughs> you can do Halford and Dickinson as well. <laughs> So you forgot Bruce. So. Ah. <laughs> actually, I, I'm actually a Paul Dano guy. Man. I, I really? Paul. Yeah, I, I love Paul. I, I like Bruce, but I like Paul better. That's you know, fair. To me are, but <laughs> you know what? It's the same thing with, that's just like the, this is the crux of the uh, Zetro Dukes, the whole thing. You are, uh, Music is attached to a time in your life, and when, when you were younger, and it's not that the music was much better, you were younger and it was yours like that so yeah those two albums were mine they were fucking mine and look man i still love fucking when when uh when when uh when number of the beast came out man i was still fucking i was at the concert i was there you know i mean so I, it wasn't that i liked it any, i just those uh hold me more dear it's just like with people that love bonded and, and that's the only record for them they they you know yep. they, they they tolerate that and they tolerate me but they just want to hear bonded I'll, I'll, you know and I, I get it I do I get it I have my own things I don't listen to new rush I listen to old rush I listen to Crest of Steel man yep. but you know what I mean you know so I mean we I'm that way too but I don't go on their websites and shit on them. <laughs> <laughs> I don't go on I don't go I just well it's, I, it's you know what I mean I, I feel like you know, come when, on. It, when it comes to music people have forgotten that music is a subjective entertainment and you know oh, the concept yeah. of something sucks <laughs> yeah. isn't the same yeah. as the concept of yeah. I don't like them yeah. <laughs> they're not well, my I'm, preference and, you know? And, and, and you know and I'm dumb as shit too so I really like what I like I mean I'm, I'm fucking dumb as fuck man. You know, <laughs> I listen I would... to Pink Floyd Animals on the way on the way here that's that's what I was listening to <laughs> that's just the way it is I, you know so Oh yeah, the, the the shit I get for liking new Metallica, God forbid. Oh no, you know it's it's people just forget that you know. And the thing is, I don't expect other people to like what I like, but don't shit on me for liking a certain thing. And that's how everybody should be, you know. 
The other night, somebody was, we were hanging out with my, with my buddies, and, I, and I, so they were shitting on, like, new Metallica, and I, and I put on something off load. I think it's called, uh, it's the last song on the album. I forget uh, what it is. It starts out Outlaw face. Torn. Dude, dude, dude. Dude, yeah, yeah. Uh, yep. Dude, they were like, dude, what is this? And I'm like, yeah, this is the album everyone shit on. It's fucking awesome. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, that bluesy great. rock that's fucking great. masterpiece that nowadays it's people fucking... are like, I wish they'd play it more. Yeah, <laughs> I love the one that. I... And then and then they knew Lou Reed was gonna die, so they were his backup band for a record. <laughs> <laughs> you think that was part Lou of the Reed arrangement? Off. You know, they didn't. I don't care who they asked, they would have done it. You know what I mean? And it's a good record, man. I mean, if you don't like Lou Reed, you're gonna hate it. But if you if you like Lou Reed, which I do. You're gonna you're gonna enjoy that album, and it's yeah. it's a good album. I was so, I was in the guilty group of not really being a fan of Lou Reed, so I, when I heard it, I was kind of like, it's like my grandfather's telling me stories I don't want to hear with a metal backing track, like, yeah. and you know doesn't again doesn't mean it's bad. <laughs> yeah. I mean, granted, I don't like everything Lou Reed does, but he has like he has a dozen tracks that I fucking, I just love, man. You know, so anyway. Yeah. But to each his own. To each his own. It's just like food. Yeah. yeah, yeah exactly. I, like I don't like that. Whatever. So I. Uh, so I want to. I don't. Um, we talked about this earlier, and I don't want to go too deep into it because God knows you've told the story <laughs> and talked about it so many times, and you know, especially now that you know things have been kind of mended up a little bit. You didn't really have the best separation from the band. Um. And was that something that took a while to kind of? put back together was it something that was just kind of a moment of convenience that put it back together or how did you guys yeah you know kind of get to the bad part and then immediately get back well not immediately it took quite a few years but you know what i mean (laughs) get back to Um, good tidings well basically what happened was uh um i gotta move to my car because uh my phone is uh i'm running low oh no (laughs) so anyway but uh, I'm gonna I'm gonna go fucking plug it in while I'm sitting in my car. Uh, um, it was bad, dude. It sucked, man. I mean, look, man. I've been I was in the band ten fucking years, and then all of a sudden, you know, you throw me out. But I, you know, it, it was you know, it was about money, and it was uh, and that's really what it was business, man. Because sometimes business goes the way it goes, you know. Yeah. Man? And you, Do it, you know what I mean? Yeah. Oh, I gotta, gotta fuck it. All good. Um, I'm gonna disconnect. No, I want my. God damn it! I want to listen with my earbuds, not my. <laughs> I'll cut this part out of the oh. podcast. <laughs> no. <laughs> All right, no, I'm good, man. I'm good. All so, right. um, anyway. So I mean, look, it took a while. I mean, I was pretty angry. I was angry. I was, I was, I was just, I was, you know what I mean? Anger is always your first uh, emotion. But I was just more, just I was, I was hurt. I was, uh, you know, these guys were my friends, and it, it just seemed uh, we were brothers and family, and and, and you know, and it, it just seemed that I got, you know, kind of, it was really bad timing uh, on top of it. So, you know, but all that said, man, it all fucking. It all uh, it all worked out. I mean, uh, Gary called me one, you know, a couple hours, and you know, and then I, and then we got up to San Francisco, and uh, we sat at a, at a at a restaurant, and we uh, all of us, and um, and we talked, and and it, and, it, we, and we, we everyone said their piece, and then it was fun and fine. I mean, I did a couple interviews, man. I did one. <laughs> On Opie and Anthony, man, I was fucking angry, and I, I shouldn't have brought it up, but uh, Jim Norton fucking asked me, and then I fucking just, I just unloaded, and I, I called them all douchebags, and like I just, it was, it was fucked up of me to do that, because up to that point, I had been pretty good about just being professional and being, you know, talking about my gratitude for my my um, the opportunity and, and stuff, so. You know, it was, I tried to keep my shit together and, and be professional, but I kind of lost it for a little bit. And then, you know, soon thereafter, I called and apologized to them and just said, explained kind of what, why, and it was all good, man. It was, you know, it was all good. And it's all good right now, man. I mean, I talk to those guys well, constantly. I mean, me and Jack talked the other day. Me and Lee talked, you know, a couple times a week. And me and Gary are 
or we talk pretty consistently. Tom's living way up in the fucking mountains, so I don't talk to him that often. And, you know, I mean, yeah, when he when he goes up to the ranch, know, he unplugs pretty heavily. Yeah, man, I I am fucking jealous of that. Mm-hmm. So anyway, so anyway, so that's kind of where it's at, man. Everything's everything's cool, man. I, I wish them all the best in the world, and yeah, and, uh, you know, I hope they, yeah. you know, that's just the way it is. So, and and you know, three years ago today. Tickets went on sale for uh, for that awesome chapel kind of reunionist show. Really, you know, it was all the surviving yeah, members, killer, yeah. and yeah. you know, I was there yeah, for that right. one. That's that's actually where I met yeah. uh, Hunting was at that show. Yeah. Um, okay. And you know that that was one of the coolest goddamn weekends. Like you know those two days it was, man. It was, it was of fun, man. camaraderie yeah. and metal out. family and uh, it's yeah. fucking awesome. And we hung out. We went to we went to Sips Bar, the Q Bar over in the Castro. We yep. went and hung out there, and and uh, you know, got, went to dinner and fucking. I mean, it was fucking awesome, man. It was it was just a great fucking weekend all around, you know. And the fans so, getting to see you up there again. Up. They were they were stoked yeah, man, about that, man. Yeah, yeah, it was it was good, man. It was good. I I know it all got filmed, and they, but then nothing ever happened with the footage. I don't, I don't. I just figured hopefully one day they put it out, but it'll be another anniversary. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Hey, I'd buy it. They've got one, but they got one buyer. <laughs> so, yeah. Exodus um, is a huge chapter, um, but there's more. There's a lot more, and I want to come at you here about Generation Kill, which you okay. formed in '08, around the time around the yeah. time you guys did Let There Be Blood. Um, yeah. And when you formed that, was that? Did you just want to do something on the side? Was Exodus not super busy, or did you just have more you wanted to get out? Like, what was the foundation for? Well, you know, I, I it was just, you know, I, I started, you know, when, when I go home off tour, I was living in New York at the time, so I started to hang out with a bunch of guys I knew from high school, and we just wanted to just to get together and fuck some play. So that's kind of what we did, you know. We just, uh, we just started jamming first we jammed some sabbath covers and then we did some other shit and then you know then one of my friends lou lehman he was like hey man i wrote this tune man and he he, he played me it and i was like oh that's awesome man can you can you put that on a, a fucking cd so i can put it in my car and listen to it when i drive around and um i went home that you know he gave it to me a couple days later i went and i fucking wrote uh lyrics for it and then we started jamming it and it was fucking awesome and then we had this friend John who was like, "Well, I'll fucking record it." And we're like, "Okay." And he had this little studio. And then, um, so we went and we recorded it. And then, over the next year of of in between tours, I, we would get together and we go in the studio and we record a couple songs here and there. And we made like a demo. Um, some French label put it out. I forget the name of the label. They were fucking cocksuckers. And then. Uh, <laughs> I had my lawyer, I got a lawyer friend and, and she got them to let us go. And then we started working on We're All Gonna Die, which was Gary had joined Slayer, so I had more time home. So we started working on this record and we all just got in a room and everyone just started sharing riffs. And then we slowly put songs together. And then um, I called my buddy Zeus um, and said, hey man, we wanna make this record and we want you to produce it. And uh, he said, okay. so." We came up with the money. We all put. We all chipped in our own money, and, and he came down and, and recorded um, the drums and the and the guitars. And then uh, I went to his house uh, after that. I went on tour and I came back and I went to his house and um, we recorded. We're all gonna die. I did all the vocals and then he mixed it and then we went on tour with Heathen. I was sent. So when when it was almost done, I sent Lee a couple tracks and fucking Altus just fucking loved it so he was like dude I want you guys to come on tour with us and I'm like oh man we can't afford it so we, we worked it out because we didn't have a label we didn't even the record wasn't even out yet it wasn't even done he just yeah. heard like the, the pre-production stuff so uh, anyway um, he took us on tour anyway man we, we worked out the money and, and we went and we went to Europe for you know five weeks and uh, we had the fucking greatest time man we fucking you know, we saw Rush play the first festival in like 20 years. Fuck. It was fucking awesome in Sweden, <laughs> man. They played Sweden Rock. And they were the headliner, and they we were fucking front row because we had, 
we had VIP shit because we were we were we were part of the whole festival. So we fucking got to go. We were sitting right in front of fucking Getty Lee. It was fucking awesome. And then uh, you know we we fucking hang out with like at the gates and fuck. It was just awesome, man. It was, it was we had such a great time. Anyway, the last couple shows of the tour we played in Germany where the show where the tour ended and the guys from Nuclear Blast came out and. Uh, they saw us play live and they said, hey man, we'll put out your record. And I said, okay, well, here's what we have in it. And we said, we'll give you that. And they gave us a contract. Uh, they sent me a contract the next day. Um, and uh, I signed it and we put out a record. And that was it. And um, unfortunately, like, we could never get, we got tour offers. We got a, a couple of tour offers, man. But, you know, one of the things about, you know, in, in, I feel bad for the younger bands is that it's so you know now you're dealing with the guys that are we're all in our, on our 40s right yep. we all have jobs and families and some guys have kids and some guys you know you can't just pick up and fucking leave at, at a fucking whim's notice and you know the tours we were getting they they, they uh, unfortunately they they couldn't they wouldn't um, we were willing to like buy our own plane tickets and some other shit but man but like we didn't have 15 grand to lay down on a bus for mm -hmm. six weeks, you know what I mean, and so and you got to pay for it in advance. And we just didn't have the money, so it was really hard to go just tour. And none of us were in a position at the time to jump in a van and just go fucking play to ten people in Wichita. Just wasn't, just couldn't live that way. I mean, I was, I was, you know, uh, you know, almost, uh, you know, I was, I was engaged at the time to, to anyway. So it was, it was just, uh, it was just hard to make that come to fruition and, and that and that sense where you you could just you know pick up and leave and go and if i was 20 i would have done it without fucking even thinking about it i would have fucked <laughs> yeah, well, yeah. But, you know, whatever but now the times are different man and it was and it was really expensive to tour and so you know um we decided that we were just going to make music for the sake of making music and whatever happens happens we'll just take it yep. from there and we'll figure it out so um, that's kind of where we're at now. So we started working on a record. We we uh, we had a, a, a couple uh, changes in the lineup, uh, the change of bass player, and and uh, but the record is this one is so fucking good, man. I got you know Gary did a solo for me on the first track, the first single. Nice. And it's coming out soon, man. We're doing like a little lyric video for it, and we're and uh, we we uh, we're starting to do the artwork now, and it's being it's being mixed right now um, by Zeus, and we're having, we're just, um, I've been working with uh, um, Mike uh, uh, Gilbert from Flotsam and Jetsam has been letting me use the studio here in Arizona, so I've been doing all the vocals here and then flying the tracks over to, to Zeus, and uh, and it's been fucking awesome, man. And, like all the guys in my band, Max, and the, the two Jasons, Jason Velez, Jason Trenzer, and, and Rob Gills, we, you know, we, we decided to, just record this album and, and just put it out and we'll see what happens and um you know if you if you the, had to speculate hope is that, would hope you is say, that people like it right yeah well i mean if you if you had to speculate would you say this year or next year pure speculation i mean it's, we're, we're gonna release the track next month so it's gonna be either later this fall or early next year one or the other so i mean it's gonna be right around that time i mean we're 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 almost 80 percent done with it you know what i mean so um, it's just, you know, it's just timing and, and waiting for everything to kind of come back to normal. I mean, I don't think anything's going to really be open until next year anyway. So yeah, we have right. time to, uh, and we've been working on these songs a long time. We had a bunch of songs, we threw them away, we started over, we, we, we you know, it's been a, it's been a battle and, and you know, um, some personal issues on my part, uh, personal issues, but from a, a couple of the other guys. So it's been, you know. It's been a, you know, it's the trial and tribulation of being in a fucking band, you know what I mean? <laughs> and especially, you know, you know, it, it, one of the things that, uh, that 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 I've realized that it, how hard it is to to live in this creative outlet. I know that I'm I'm actually just kind of like complaining, but for me personally, it's really hard to work a full time job and then go home at night and force myself to be creative. It doesn't yep. It doesn't happen that way for me. It happens at, at three o'clock in the morning, uh, you know what I mean? And, 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 I, and, and it happens when I'm not expecting it. And if I'm, 
if it happens when I'm like reading a book or watching something a, a, a documentary or something that's you know I'm in, in you know you know looking at it and I'm, I'm absorbing it and all of a sudden I'm like oh those would be that'd be a great lyrics so that'd be a great fucking way to take you know some some things to say in this in these lyrics or and it just kind of it, it's kind of like unmanufactured it just kind of happens itself and when I force it shit comes out you know what I mean it's yeah. like oh, and I throw it all away so and the idea behind Generation Kill was not just to make a thrash band because I, I was already doing that in Exodus so I wanted something different I remember one of my favorite albums of all time is Sad Wings and Destiny and it has like it has a whole piano song and it has a bunch of acoustic stuff and Judas Priest definitely was one of the, the, the mentors of, of, of the way that I approached this of putting this band together was because I wanted to, I didn't want to just go straight thrash across the all across the board. We could have, we definitely have the ability to do that. Yeah. But it also seemed it almost like okay, well, you know what? There's more to it than that. Like I remember, like like when you listen to like Master Puppets or you listen to uh, you know the, the earlier Iron Maiden records, they were like a roller coaster, man. They'd have something real fast, and then they'd be. You know, then they bring it down. You know what I yep. mean, like Prodigal Son, and then they pack it back up with fucking. So that's kind of the thing. Whereas I didn't want to stay uh, locked into one thing. I wanted to be able to branch out and do other shit and other stuff that inspired me, other stuff that made me just you know feel cool about being doing music. You know what I mean? With other people, a lot of times it's it's who you're working with too. You know, like other people, you you're you're inspired by their their writing or whatever their their. You know, they're playing, and you're like, oh, that's fucking awesome, man. I'd love to be able to write to that. And then, well, there's, you know, then I, mean, it just I mean, the uniqueness of what you've done, because, it, you know, that, that could also bring us into Fragile Mortals, which you worked yeah. on with uh, Mr. DMC himself yeah. from Run DMC, yeah. Daryl. Um, yeah. Like, what was, what really brought that to fruition? You know, a lot of people talk about... Uh, you know, I've heard Scott Ian talking about kind of, you know, how he got in with, in with Public Enemy and that little crossover movement. And, you know, Run DMC obviously yeah. is no stranger to that, having worked with Aerosmith. Um, yeah. What brought you well, guys together? Well, I mean, that, that's kind of what... So I, I, I met Daryl at a, at a festival, and, uh, and we started talking. And then, um, so he, I, he and I ended up giving him a, a copy of... Uh, the we're all gonna die record and uh so he took it home and then like a week later he uh he gets in touch with me through um through uh he sent me a, a message on twitter a private message and he, he said dude we need to talk so i sent him my number he called me and he was really excited and he loved the song carney love he's like dude that song it's like it's like a movie in my head man and i'm like yeah fucking awesome they're like glad you like it man cool he goes dude uh, I'm doing this solo record. I want you to write a song with me. And I'm like, okay. So I uh, I called uh, my guitar player and, and uh, I said, hey man, we need to. I met DMC and he wants to do a song together. And then um, he said, okay. So I uh, I told him. So I I had recently moved and I, I I saw my first after all the years of touring. I actually saw my first Lot Lizard, which was um, a uh, a truck stop hooker. And I said, Daryl, let's write the song about that. Let's write the song about the a truck stop hooker. And he said, okay. So I had no idea what he was going to say. or what, I just knew what I was going to do. And we, had, we wrote it. We had the music. We set the music up. And then we said, okay, you're going to sing from here to here, here to here, and here to here. And I'll, and I'll do the chorus, and I'll sing this part. And that's what we did. And we showed up, and it just fucking flowed, and it just ended up working. And it was he was such a fucking nice guy and such a good human being. And um, it was really just... You know, fucking working with a guy who was in the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame, it was uh, it was always a little bit um, weird because I'm like, God damn it, I can't believe like this, this dude wants to write songs with me, man. I don't fucking get it, but whatever. I'm not I'm not judging it. Whatever, not man. Not complain. <laughs> no, man. So you know, I mean, and then we, we I, you know, we asked. He wanted to do something a little heavier, and so we started writing other songs, and then we ended up with with a bunch of songs, and then. Uh, yeah, and then unfortunately the business end of it all all came to came to a, a crashing halt at the end. But nonetheless, I did it, and I know I did it, and I had a blast doing it. And I still talk. To, matter of fact, me and Daryl talked for like a half an hour the other day on on Sunday. We were just we were just bullshitting and talking about life, and just you know we we you know we we 
still talk, you know, pretty often. And, and uh, he's just a he's just a wonderful human being. And uh, I, you know, I love the guy. He's fucking great. I mean, it's know? good. It's good that he's doing well. He's not. He's not a super public guy at all. So it's nice to know that he's he's doing good. And, yeah. You know. Yeah, he's, man. Yeah. I mean. Yeah. His son is. His son is is starting to to, to start to have a career. Um, and he's he's awesome, man. He's he's uh, he's really creative, and he, he he spends a lot of time in the studio, and uh, and uh, it's pretty awesome to watch, man. Some of his stuff is really good. I mean, you know, it's it's hip hop, so if you don't like hip hop, you're not gonna like it. Yep. So, but I like hip hop, so you know, I, mean, I like hip hop, so it's fine, and and, uh, and and it has a place on the planet, that's for sure. You know. So how did uh, how did Bumblefoot get involved in that? Because that was kind of uh, out of nowhere. I met Ron. Yeah, I met Ron. I met Ron um, years ago. I mean, back in early or mid like two thousands, and uh, he w- w- worked with us. And I, I um, he ended up he was mixing stuff that I was a part of, and then I went and I did. You know this, the the podcast Talking Metal. You know John and, and uh, Mark yeah. yep. Talking Metal. So. We, we, I always did it. I always like playing with those, those guys. They're a band. They have a band and they all play. So we did a couple. So I did a couple songs with them. And then one of the songs was um, "Snowblind" by Black Sabbath. And it was, it was uh, Dan Lorenzo from Hades and and, uh, and Vessel of Light. And so anyway, we we did this song at the Gibson Studios, and it was so much fun to do. And uh, Bumble ended up mixing that. And uh, so when we were doing this record, I called him. I said, "Hey, man." I'm working with Daryl. Do you want to do you want to mix this? And he's like, "Fuck yeah!" So you know, we ended up working out the the uh, business side of all that, and, and then it all you know just happened. And Ron played on it. His guitar playing is you know phenomenal as as, as you know you would expect. Mm-hmm. I mean, uh, him and Buckethead, I think, are like the two the craziest guitar players. Well, Dweezil Zappa is pretty fucking awesome. But, I'd, I'd uh, put John but Five in their are, category you know, too, for sure. John oh, Five, John a huge Five, yeah, fan of John, John Five. Five. Yeah, no, John Five, totally. Yeah, I love John. So yeah, so you know, it, it just you know, it, you know, and it was just cool to work with him. He's a beautiful human. Matter of fact, I talked to him yesterday. Um, he's he's awesome, and so he's singing for Asia now, which was fucking. Oh really? I don't know if you saw it, man. It was, it was fucking killer, dude. <laughs> yeah, it was fucking great. Heat of the moment, man. I never forget that fucking song that summer that it came out. Just it was it was every other song on the radio. It was every point yes. of the <laughs> moment, and it's so fucking yeah. So uh, one whatever. One last yeah. thing I <laughs> want to touch on here um, yeah. is something I've read about a lot, which is Blood Moon yeah. Ritual. Is that still something that's floating around? Is that something that? Uh, no, you know, I mean, it would have been awesome to do, but it was it was logistics. It just didn't happen, man. It was just, uh, we just couldn't get all on the same page. And uh, I love Eric and, and, uh, and Gonzo, and, and those guys are great. And, and Greg was awesome. But just, you know, it was logistically, you know, you have one guy in New Mexico, one guy in L.A., and then two guys in Arizona. And it just, you know, it couldn't really happen. And then Chris Canella got into Deicide. So yep. it kind of just kind of took a, it took a turn for the, Hey man, hopefully we can come back to this. But you know, it was we we wanted to do it. It just it just you know logistically just couldn't couldn't take place at the time. So you know maybe we'll, if later down the road when we're old and fucked up, we'll all get together for uh, <laughs> a couple weeks. Every some shit, you know what I mean? But hey, it was just it was just a, a cool idea, and, and we we all wanted to do it. Just just couldn't it just logistically couldn't happen. So anyway, yeah, but, it makes sense. Guys. So you've yeah. got. We're we're looking forward to a new GK album. Is there anything yeah, else you've got coming down the pipe? Because you're usually uh, pretty busy, so primarily yeah, focused I, uh, on that. No, I mean, Generation Kill is really my focus right now. I've been, uh, I you know, before this, uh, I know I didn't want, we didn't want to talk about COVID, but before this, I started doing uh, stand-up comedy, and I started doing really? it here in Arizona. And I started doing stand-up and. And was doing it uh, pretty consistently, and then uh, this kind of in January it all kind of went away. So I, everyone's kind of had to just everyone closed. So I just got to wait. And, but uh, I had fun doing that, man. It was like it was like therapy. I'd go up there and I would I would talk about my depression and my fucking all the other shit going on in my life, and I just dump it out on stage and <laughs> try to make people laugh with it. And that's just what I was doing, and it was 
it was cool, man. It was it was fun, but um, I haven't done it in a while. But I think they're starting to open up. I think either last Sunday of June or the last Sunday of July will be the first like open mic that I'll uh, probably go to. And that's all I've done right now is open mic. So I mean, I'm just having fun doing it, man. It's just something to to do other than um, you know sit at home and watch 60 minutes. On, on no, nobody TV. nobody wants to watch the news right now. That's for damn sure. No, no, all right. I've been reading books. That's all I've been doing. Good, smart thing. Okay, so, sir, I want to thank you so much for your time today. I know you thanks. are thanks, bud. getting a, getting to relax, but also super busy at the same time. Managing time right now is weird yeah. because it's almost like time doesn't exist. Um, yeah. Thank you guys all for tuning in. I very, very much appreciate it. Uh, thank you to Mr. Dukes for your time today. You are wonderful, and I can't wait to hear that new album. And we will oh, see you guys next week.